Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6 through 14. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6 through 14. If you are of the age three, between 3 and 8, you can head to that back door to my left where you will be in classroom 1 with Brooke. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 6 through 14. I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Holy and Aaron and Infallible Word of God. It reads, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of life is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his holy, inerrant, and infallible word. You may be seated. You know, it's, well, you've probably seen a movie or you've probably had an experience of sorts where there is uh, something very wrong that someone tries to ignore or play off as if nothing is wrong. Um, maybe you've seen a movie where there, someone is, has an injury and there's this incredible, gruesome injury and they're not looking at it because they can't see it, but they're asking their friend who was witnessing, witnessing it, hey, am I okay? And the friend's looking at this bloody, gruesome injury. Maybe a leg is broken and it's going one way that it shouldn't be going and the friend's looking and saying, yeah, 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 it's okay, man, it's okay. You're, you're, gonna, you're gonna be okay, right? Um, I've said on many occasions that if you're ever with me and I got something on my nose or something in my nose, just tell me, right? You don't have to look at me, make it seem like it's okay when there's clearly something wrong. Does that make sense? Just let me know. You don't have to make a big pronouncement about it. You can tap me on my shoulder, tell me privately. But nevertheless, I want to know. I don't want you to leave me in the state that you found me. Does that make sense? so that I can meet 10 other people with something, something in my nose, knowing that my best friend or one of my good friends left me in that condition. Similarly, Paul is dealing with what appears to be a group of people that's telling people it's okay when it's not okay. That's where he starts. He ends up going in a, he ends up not necessarily a different direction, but he ends up diving deeper into this particular condition but he starts by talking to a group of people that seem to be content telling people that it's okay when things are really not okay. And so what's not okay is walking in darkness. What's not okay is walking in darkness rather than walking in the light. And Paul wants to make that abundantly clear. And in order to do that, he highlights a couple of things. He highlights the darkness and he highlights the light. And there's elements and there's calls that he's calling us to as we think about the darkness and there's calls that he is calling us to as we think about the light. Let's first deal with the darkness. Paul calls us to two things in this text regarding the darkness. Number one, reject it. Reject the darkness. 
reject the darkness's deception in particular. And then number two, avoid the darkness. And when I say avoid the darkness, we are talking about in particular avoiding the darkness in the sense of avoiding its handle on us. Does that make sense? So reject the darkness and reject its deception is where we start. Verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Paul begins this text with a cautionary tale or a caution, or caution rather, to the Ephesian church that flows directly from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. We talked about chapter 5, verse 5 last week briefly, and here's the continuation of that. Verse 5, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. If you were with us last week, you may recall me saying that this verse wasn't intended to set up some sort of moral quota on sin for us. This wasn't intended for us to be in this constant kind of state where we're saying, wait a second, did I do something greedy, impure, or sexually immoral last week? Okay, then, I'm probably going to miss heaven. It's not keeping track or keeping record in that sense. That's not how this text is intended to be used. It is first intended as a reminder to be who we are in Christ, to be the people that live in accordance to this other life, not the dark life, but the light life, to live in accordance to the other life, the dark life, you will end up with no kingdom inheritance. So don't live like those people. That's what this is intended to remind us of. However, it's not an empty threat. And Paul further highlights that in verse 6 of this text. He says, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. If you are in a bad condition, let no one deceive you and tell you you're good. Everything's okay. Paul apparently has some false teachers and some false believers in mind as he, as he writes this. Some who are telling the saints in Ephesus that there were, there were no consequences at all for a life contrary to the life that God had called them to live. And this is deception with empty words. That's what he means when he says deception with empty words. We don't know the form that this deception is coming in, but there were plenty of different forms and different directions that Paul could be speaking to and that he could be picking from. For example, in that day and time, some would have argued that our bodies were in some way detached from our spiritual lives, from our spirit man, our inner man. And thus, because they were detached, they bear no consequence on the spirit. Meaning that I could do whatever I want to do with this body. Sleep with whoever I want to sleep with, with this body, because this body is detached from the spirit. Some people were saying that. Paul is saying deception with empty words. Some, um, some in Ephesus or around Ephesus or in antiquity would have argued even that our sexual appetites were no different than any other appetite of the body. So to say no to your internal cravings would be in some sense to starve your body. And that's the real harm some people would tell you. Paul would say that's deception with empty words. Your body is not like, or, your, or sex is not like food in the sense that you just have to have it. And if you don't have it, you're doing harm to yourself. But many people were saying that. Some would have argued that because God is love and God is mercy, that there is no way he will punish people if they say that they love him, even though they do everything and live a life completely contrary to what he has asked of them. And Paul would say, again, don't be deceived with empty words. What are some of the empty words that you and I hear in this day and age? Some of the kind of empty words that are subject to deceive us in this culture. Maybe we hear empty words like, it doesn't take all that. 
Why are you doing, why are you doing all of that? I love Jesus too. Maybe it's empty words like, if it feels good, do it. Maybe it's empty words like, it's not all that bad if you do X, Y, and Z. Maybe it's empty words like, it's your life, it's your body, do whatever you want to do with it. Maybe it's empty words like, if your heart says do it, then follow your heart. Maybe it's empty words like, if God wanted me to do it, then he wouldn't make it so hard for me to stop doing it. Or if he wanted me not to do it, rather, then he wouldn't make it so hard for me to stop doing it. Empty words that are deceitful. You know, Michael Douglas won the 1988 Academy Award. Anybody know Michael Douglas? Anybody? Okay, cool. Okay, cool. So he's, he's still living. I'm getting old, <laughs> right? I'm getting old. There's some kids in here right now. I mean, not kids, but there's some young adults in here like, I don't know Michael. Who is Michael Douglas? Never, never heard of that guy, right? Well, Michael Douglas won the 1988 Academy Award for Best Actor for his role of Gordon Gecko in the movie Wall Street. Anybody ever heard of the movie Wall Street? That's an old one. It was said that the character Gordon Gecko in this movie was based on loosely several Wall Street guys that the writer and director kind of ran into and encountered, even his own father. And Gecko, Gordon Gecko in this movie was the villain of villains. He's, he's like one of, literally rated as one of the top 50 villains, movie villains of all times. Gordon Gecko, he's slick, he's smart, he's persuasive, he's greedy, he's corrupt. And there's this scene in the movie where he perfectly highlights the power of deception with empty words. Gecko, again played by Michael Douglas, is asked to give a speech to this, this corporation or this company at this corpor cor corporate event. And he gives them some pleasantries and some introductory comments, and then he dives into this speech, and this is what he says. He says, the point is, ladies and gentlemen, the point is that greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies. It cuts through. It captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all of its forms. Greed for life, for money, for love, for knowledge. Greed has marked the upward surge of mankind. And greed, you mark my words, will not only save this company, but that other malfunctioning corporation called the USA. End quote. Empty words used to deceive. Now, maybe you're not a Michael Douglas fan. Maybe you're an Eddie Murphy fan. Eddie Murphy in Vampire in Brooklyn, which I do not recommend, <laughs> became a preacher as a vampire. He disguised himself as a preacher, and Eddie Murphy simply said, evil is good. And he continued preaching and all of the charisma that he shared as he was sharing evil is good by the end of his Five-minute sermon, people were singing, people were shouting, they were dancing, and they had a new song, Evil is Good. Why? Because there were empty words being used to deceive. Why do empty words have so much power over us? Well, they often have power because they are words that our flesh and the old man want to hear. They are words that the world has conditioned us to hear. And they are words that the world has amplified in its messages and in its imagery, in its videos, in its commercials, amongst its stars. And they are also words that Satan never grows tired of sowing into our heads and into the culture. But Paul urges us not to be deceived. The wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Some of that, some, some call that use of that present tense that Paul uses comes, the, 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 word, the wrath of God comes. They say that's prophetic present tense. In other words, it's so certain that it's going to happen that Paul can literally envision it happening as he is writing the letter. That wrath is coming 
to the sons of disobedience. Now, the use of wrath, that word is very interesting because Paul, not too far back in this letter, urges us to leave wrath behind. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, he says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. And yet, now just a few verses down, he's reminding us that wrath is coming. Why is that? You see, because God is the only one who unleashes wrath from a position of worthiness and wisdom. See, only God can give wrath with complete worthiness and complete wisdom. He is perfect, and thus he stands in the place of judge. No sin, no spot, no wrinkles, perfect and holy, we are not. Thus he can release it. But also he is all-knowing. He knows what's in us and has perfect knowledge pertaining to how to judge us perfectly, and we are not. So don't allow the call away from wrath for you to exercise to fool you into thinking that God will not show wrath to those who reject them. Paul says that is words, empty words leading to deception. The word sons of disobedience is an old Jewish phrase that is referencing unbelievers, but in particular, people who carry a consistent pattern of disobedience and rejection of God and his word and his ways. So do not be deceived. These people walking in these patterns, Paul says, will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will, they will inherit the wrath of God. Paul says it in another way in Galatians chapter 6. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. We will not live in contrary, in contrary style to God, in contrary manner towards God, and expect at the end to say, hey, God, I know I was doing my own thing, but you let me in, right? Paul says, be not deceived. So avoid or reject the darkness's deception, but also reject or avoid the darkness's partnership. Look at verse 7. Therefore, do not become partners with them. You see, because God is not allowing or not going rather to allow these types of lives, entry and entrance into the eternal kingdom of God, Paul says, do not join our lives to them. Do not join your life to lives that are dominated and marked by continual disobedience of God's word. Do not join your life to lives that are dominated and marked by people who are walking in such disobedience that they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not join your life to lives that are dominated and marked by continual self-seeking and continual self-serving because that will not inherit the kingdom of God. So when we are witnesses to such lives, we must reject partaking alongside those lives. Now, this, now listen, listen, this is not a call to completely remove yourself from people who don't know God. Because remember, we highlighted this last week. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 tells us that, or verse 9 and 10 tells us that if you try to completely remove yourself from people that are not walking with God, then you got to take yourself out of the world. No, you're supposed to be amongst people that are not walking with God. You're supposed to be sharing your life with people who are not walking with God. So what does Paul mean if he doesn't mean that? Because obviously we can't shine in the darkness with light unless we're in the darkness to shine. So if he's not talking about that, then what is he talking about? If he's not talking about association in terms of just being around people. He's talking about association in terms of partnering. Partnership and participation. You hear that? Partnership and participation. Paul is referring to the kind of partnership and participation that leads to the imitation, celebration, elevation, and accepting the education of those in darkness. Imitation, celebration, 
elevation and participate or accepting the education of those that are walking in darkness. As people in the light, we cannot take our cues from the darkness in the culture and imitate the culture and celebrate the hypersexuality of the culture because, the, because if we get involved in imitating and celebrating a culture that cheapens the covenantal marriage between one husband and one wife, now we are partnering with the darkness. Do you understand that? As people in the light, we cannot take our cues from the darkness in the culture and elevate greediness and elevate discontentment and elevate gr uh, grumbling and complaining about our lives and elevate, elevate over and over again just this kind of unease and this need for more as the chosen pattern of life. We cannot let their wisdom be our wisdom. That's what Paul is saying. It's that wisdom, by the way, that leads to corruption of all types. Is that wisdom that leads to all sorts of anxiety and all sorts of depression and all sorts of burnout? Because we never, never have enough, no matter how much we have. Is that wisdom that leads to broken homes because we keep training ourselves in the empty words that our families need our wallets more than they need our relationships? When talks about partnership, when Paul talks about partnership, rather, this is what he has in mind. The kind of participation with the darkness in our culture and in our society and in our world that leads to imitating it, celebrating it, elevating it, and being educated by it. Do we love those in the world who have been overtaken by the darkness? Without question. Do we show kindness and generosity and gentleness in this world to those who have been overtaken by the darkness? Absolutely. Do we listen with patience and listen with humility and listen with a commitment to understand before we begin to criticize or correct people that are in the world? No doubt. And it's incredibly important, by the way, that we do this. Here's the, here's, here's the irony here. We do this because when we don't do this, we are in fact participating in the darkness. You see, to engage the darkness with meanness, smugness, ugliness, pride, incessant mo mocking, hatred, deceit, lies, that's partnering in the darkness. Even when you're doing that, quote unquote, to address sexual immorality or to address, to address greediness, to do that that way is to participate and partner in darkness. It's just taking the back door to get there. So if you think that God is smiling down on us when we decide that we are going to combat the horrors of an overly sexualized, greedy, and selfish culture by being ourselves horrible people and horrible towards them, you are deceived with empty words. I know there's some out there that are telling you that's exactly what you need to do and it's going to be okay and you're good and this is exactly what God wants you to do. And nothing in this Bible confirms or affirms that. Paul in his, in his instruction to his young pastoral apprentice by the name of Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, he offers him these words of counsel. He says, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. In other words, love to fight, love to pick fights, love to stir up fights, but kind to everyone, able to teach patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. Did you hear what he told him is required of Christian leadership? Kindly engaging the darkness, patiently engaging the darkness, gently engaging the darkness. These are not my words, these are God's words. And so to do otherwise is to do what? Participate in the darkness. Now, it's about, that's about all the darkness. Let's dive real quickly into the light. So reject the darkness, reject the deception of the darkness, the empty words that tells you that the life you live is inconsequential, so do whatever you want to do and God will be pleased. Reject that. 
because he will not be. His wrath is reserved for those who take on this pattern of life and it reveals that they most likely do not know him, so reject that. And avoid partnership of the darkness. Continue to engage, continue to build loving relationships, but avoid participating in such a way where you imitate, celebrate, elevate, and accept the education of the darkness. And why is that? Verse 8, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You were darkness. I was darkness. That's such an incredible and disturbing statement. Not you were in darkness. You, we, we, get, we get that in the Bible. But here, it's just simply you were darkness. You were darkness in the sense that before Christ came, there was no true light in us. We were darkness in the sense that before Christ came, the works that we produced were darkness. Not because every work that we produced was evil or bad, but because they weren't for God's glory. The work didn't point to the light. The work was basically for our own glory or the glory of some other God, perhaps. And thus it was dark. You were darkness in the sense that we were without true direction, neither able to find our way nor able to fully point people to the way. Back then it made sense for us to partner with those in darkness because we too were a part of the darkness. We were the darkness, but not anymore, thanks be to God. Paul says, not anymore. You are now light. You were darkness, not simply in darkness, but were darkness, and now you are light. Not just simply in light, but you are light. What happened? You are light in the Lord. This is how you became light, in the Lord. Not because of your renowned resume, not because of your astonishing acts, not because of your impeccable intellect. You became light because you were introduced to the light. The Apostle Peter says it this way. He basically said he called us out of darkness into his marvelous light in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. So since you were called into his marvelous light, you too became light. You are light because Christ took on the darkness in your place. You are light because on that day when Christ was hung, what did we see cover the land? Darkness. But early Sunday morning, when he rose, what rose with him? Light. And we became witnesses and partakers of that light. So now is light, what is our call and what is our mandate? Walk as children of the light. That's what he says in verse, the latter part of verse 8. Walk as children of light. We are not who we used to be. You are not who you used to be. We are not the darkness any longer. We are not bound to the idols of power and money and sex and self. We no longer worship the created. We worship the creator through whom we are now made light. So walk in that light. Live in that light. And Paul gives us, a, gives us a few ways that we are to do that. How, how do you walk in the light? How do you live in the light? First, bear the fruit of the light. Look at verse 9. Verse 8, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Paul says when we walk in the light, we will produce the fruit of the light. And what is the fruit of the light? Goodness. What does goodness mean? Goodness means moral excellence. Goodness means generosity. Goodness means kindness. Goodness means that you produce beauty, meaning that you bring out beauty in the things and in the people around you. Goodness means that being in your presence makes me better. Are you following this? Goodness means happiness, that there's a sense of joy that comes with your life. And there's a sense of joy that comes with you encountering others. This is what it means to walk as children of the light, to bring goodness to the world around you. 
But it also means, Paul says, the fruit is right. Righteousness. What is righteousness? Righteousness is a pursuit of a moral standard. Righteousness is a commitment to doing right. It is a commitment to doing justice. It is pursuing the kind of life that is, that is not governed or ruled by bias and by partiality and by favoritism. But it's about doing what is right. Do you walk in the light? As children of the light, do you pursue goodness? Do you pursue justice and righteousness? But also, what else? Paul says, is the fruit truth, honesty, a refusal to walk in our own words, but to hold up high God's words as the rule and as the standard for our life, because it is only God's words that are wholly true. And so this is what it means to walk in the light. When we are walking in the light, we are producing goodness. We are producing righteousness. We are reverberating truth and sharing truth with anybody and everybody that we come in contact with. That's what it means to walk in the light. So bear the fruit of the light. Here's another way that you walk in the light. Discern the will of the Father of light. Look at verse 10. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. This is what it means to walk in the light. To try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. There's a clue here in the word try. Because it speaks to effort, right? And it speaks to a journey, doesn't it? Doesn't it speak to a journey? There's going to be times, in other words, as you try, there's going to be times that you succeed. And then there's going to be times that you try, and then you're going to fail to discern what is the will of the Lord. But try means that you are on a continuous journey to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. A lot of us want to get saved today and walk in all the wisdom of salvation tomorrow. But wisdom is a journey and a process. In fact, this word for discernment is literally testing out and approving. That's what it means. Testing out and approving. It's the same word that was used to describe a battle-tested soldier or a precious metal that's gone through uh, of some type of conditioning to determine whether or not it was valuable. And so it's a testing, it's a proving. So what does it mean to try to discern what is pleasing with, to the Lord? It points to a discernment that is on an ever-increasing journey. And as it continues to walk with the Lord, it grows in its ability to discern what is pleasing to him. The other place where you see this same word for discernment, the same Greek word is in Romans chapter 12, where it says, I appeal to you therefore by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing, that same word, you may discern, rather, that same word, what is the will of God. Testing, you may discern. How do I get to the place where I test and I'm able to discern? By presenting my bodies regularly, presenting my body as a living sacrifice. How do I get to the place where I can test and discern what the will of the Lord is? By having my mind transformed over and over and over again. Discernment happens when you lay your life down routinely for the Lord. Discernment comes as you are decreasingly being conformed to the patterns that we see in the world, and you are increasingly being transformed in your mind to the ways and the patterns of Jesus. That's where discernment comes from. Discernment isn't just something you're going to wake up with one day because you prayed last night for discernment. Discernment is an ongoing journey that you will increasingly mature in as you are increasingly laying your life down for the Lord and increasingly being transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, I played a little basketball back in the day, a little bit, a little bit growing up. Not, 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 not a whole lot, a little bit. But one thing I can tell you is that I practiced a lot. And the more I practiced, the smarter I became as a basketball player. The more I practiced, the more I understood the angles of the game better. 
The more I practiced, the more I understood what steps would create an advantage for me off the dribble and what step would put me at a disadvantage. The more I practiced, the more I better understood offensive tendencies of my opponent. So not only could I think about what steps I need to take, but I started beginning to see what steps they would take and what steps I needed to take to put me in the best defensive position to keep them from the basket. I wasn't the most talented dude, but being on the court and around the game increased my intellect and my ability to discern what's happening in the game in real time. Repetitive, redundant, and oftentimes boring practice. But it made me smarter. It made me wiser. It made me able to discern how to play the game. Repetitive, redundant, and sometimes boring time with God. Time in his word, time in prayer, Time in fellowship, time in community increases your ability to discern what in fact is pleasing to the Lord. It reshapes your decision making. I won't even go into any names, but we had somebody just recently who had this big decision that was on their plate. And just being in the fellowship of the saints, we didn't even talk about the decision. Just being in the fellowship and just associating with the saints and just spending time in the Word. And by the time we end, we're like, Pastor, we don't even need to talk about it. I know what we need to do. I know what I need to do. Why? Because that time creates discernment. You see, as you resolve to put one foot in front of the other every day, as you resolve to pick up his Word every day, as you resolve and commit to stay in fellowship with the saints, as much as possible, as you resolve to connect with brothers and sisters who have been on this journey before you, and you say, man, let me sit at your feet for a little while and just listen to what God has done in your life. As you resolve to do that, God increases your ability to discern what is pleasing to him. And it starts becoming secondhand. But as you do what? As you resolve to be in the world, following the patterns of the world, engulfed in the cues of the world, in the messages of the world, in the images of the world, and all of the culture of the world, then what can you only expect but for it to become increasingly difficult for you to figure out what God wants you to do? Does that make sense? Lastly, verse 11, take no part in the fruit, unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So we talked about, Paul says to walk in the light means to bear the fruit of the light, and to walk in the light means to grow increasingly in our ability to discern the will of the Father of the light. But here, to walk in the light means to shine the light in such a way that it exposes the darkness. In verse 11, Paul has in mind the same works we've been discussing. When he says, take no part in the unfruitful works. It's the same works. It's the works of impurity, uncleanliness. It's the works of, the works of sexual immorality. It's the works of covetousness. It's the works of idolatry. All the things that we've been talking about since we've been in chapter 5. And here he's teaching us. Again, and reminding us to take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. What is he showing us here? He's showing us something very plainly. You cannot expose what you indulge. You cannot expose what you indulge. If we are to be the light, we cannot be constantly indulged in the darkness. I mean, we even see that even in the church, um, as the church, the, the hens come home to roost for the church, right? When the church is found unwilling to confront sexual immorality in its own camp, it should not be surprised when those in the darkness don't want to hear us calling for them to come to the light of sexual purity. When we won't confront it, they're like, okay, we can just do what we're doing out here then. When the church uses ugliness and smugness and hatred, 
as a means of exposing darkness. It should not be surprised when those in the darkness don't want to hear about the love, the patience, and the grace that they will find in Christ. Because I haven't received a whole lot of love, patience, and kindness from you. We can't expose the darkness that we indulge in. In order to expose it, you have to step out of it, to step into the light, and then use the light to shine back into the darkness. And then lastly, we can't expose what we will not engage. That's the next lesson Paul teaches us here. Are you taking your light to the darkness? See, in order for the darkness to be exposed, the light has to be there. Sometimes what we do is we basically place our light under bushels, and then we look around and we ask ourselves, why is it so dark out here? It's like you holding a flashlight and turning it off, and then asking, why is it so dark around you? Darkness is exposed when the light comes. So when you are living your life not in, a, not in a way that's indulging the darkness, but in a way that contrasts from the darkness, where it's like, oh, there's something different about that dude. There's something different about that sister. She doesn't live the same way that we live. She's still very kind and she's still very generous to us and she's still very merciful. And she's still very patient towards us, but she doesn't live like we live. He doesn't live like we live. And there's an incredible kindness, and an, but there's an incredible peace there, too. There's an incredible joy there, too. I've seen them when, I, when, when, when it should have been, when they should have been frantic. I've seen them where they should have been cussing somebody out. I've seen them where they should have been extremely angry, and that's not the way they responded. There's something different there. And what's happening, saints? The light is exposing the darkness. Not by indulging in it, but by shining on it. By being with it and amongst it, and while you're with it and amongst it, you're shining on it. And why do you shine? You shine because Christ shined on you. Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Why, why do we shine? Why do we shower the world with light? Why do we move not to indulge the darkness, but to engage it with light? Because Christ shined on you. He shined on you when he came down from heaven and took on the form of a servant. He shined on you when he lived a perfect life on your behalf. He shined on you when he was unjustly persecuted by Rome and by the Jewish leaders. He shined on you when he took the punishment the lashes on his back, the crown of thorns on his head. He shined on you when he carried that cross all the way to Golgotha and Calvary's Hill. He shined on you when he was pierced in his hands and in his feet, when he was pierced in his side by the sword. He shined on you when instead of saying, Father, take them all down, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He shined on you when he declared, it is finished. And the breath left out, left out of his body and he was buried in a borrowed tomb and arrayed with perfumes and scents. And he shined on you while he was there for three days, but on the third he rose from the grave with all power in his hand. He shined on you when he ascended into the heavens where he sits making bold, gracious, merciful intercession for you every single moment in your breathing life. He shined light on you. That's why you shine, because you've received so much light, so much light that you have no choice. We have no choice but to give it. Let's pray. Lord, we love you so much, and we